Witches have been a part of my life since I can remember. Every year for Halloween, I wanted to be a witch. Even when I had to be a princess or a clown, I would cry until I was allowed to put the hat on. But what makes this iconic October staple so memorable and lovable? Let's take a look. The history of witches is a long and rich one, dating beyond written record. However, the establishment of Christianity in the first century AD, witches are essentially the pagan people in society. The first established record of mentioning witches can actually be found in the Bible, in Book 1 of Samuel, written around 931 BC. King Saul sought out the witch Endor to summon the dead prophet Samuel's spirit to defeat the Philistine army. The witch prophesied the death of Saul and his sons. The next day, Saul's sons died in battle and he committed suicide. However, the most notable history of witches is not in the Bible. Of course, it's the witch trials. The first recorded witch trial took place in Kilkenny, Ireland in 1324. Dame Alice de Keitler, born in 1280, and her servant Petronella were both accused of being witches. Alice fled and escaped persecution, but Petronella was flogged and burned at the stake November 3, 1324. In the 1400s, witch hysteria swept the world. It usually targeted, but was not limited to, single or widowed women, or marginal, nondescript people in the community. Between 1500 and 1660, 80,000 witches were put to death in Europe alone. The Hammer of Witches is a book by German Dominicans in 1486. It is a guide on how to identify, hunt, and interrogate witches. Think of it like witch hunting for dummies. It described witches as having a witch's mark, not unlike a wart or a mole being unable to survive in water, and having unexplainable power. For more than 100 years, this book was the second most sold book after the Bible. Salem, 1692. That's right, the infamous Salem witch trials. Nine-year-old Elizabeth Paris and 11-year-old Abigail Williams suffer fits of body contortion and uncontrollable screaming. Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tituba are accused of witchcraft. However, Bridget Bishop is the first person in Salem put to death for witchery on June 10th. Of the 150 people accused of witchcraft, 18 were sentenced to death. Even after the witch hysteria died down in the 18th century, stories of witches and their horrific deeds lived on. In 1812, a very famous story was written which would soon become a classic piece of children's literature. Hansel and Gretel, written by the Grimm brothers in 1812. During this time, children were often abandoned due to not being able to care for them, or they were cannibalized. There are several versions of the fairy tale, but all include the evil witch in the woods. The fear of witches was still mainstream entertainment for people during this time. There was no way that a person practicing witchcraft could be good. Witches and fairy tales aren't limited in regional folklore. In Russia, the witch Baba Yaga is one of three or a trio of sisters all by the same name. She appears as a ferocious and deformed old woman. She flies around in a mortar and yields a pestle. She dwells deep within the forest in a hut, described as standing on chicken legs. She may help or hinder those she encounters. She is described as being either helpful, villainous, or completely ambiguous. She often serves as a maternal figure. The first clear reference is in 1755 and Mikhail Lomonosov's Ruska Grammatica, in which the list is compiled in comparison from Russian folklore to Roman and Greek mythology. Even Arthurian literature has a witch of its own, the sorceress Morgan Le Fay. Morgan Le Fay represents control, manipulation, and sorcery. She uses manipulative power to get what she wants. In many stories, she's the villain, evil, temptress, and overly sexual. In other stories, she's the heroine. She is considered a woman of mystery because there is no rhyme or reason as to when she's the hero or when she's the villain. There are numerous other witches which are featured in literature, from C.S. Lewis's White Witch to the witches mentioned in Shakespeare's Macbeth, to Frank L. Baum's Witches of Oz. But Baum's interpretation didn't hit the iconic status until it was shown on the silver screen. Cut to the 1900s. Literature, though so prominent, is being met by a new competitor, film. And in 1939, the most iconic witch would reach the cinema. One who would be known as not just the greatest interpretation of a witch, but also one of the greatest antagonists of cinema. The Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. Depicted as a cruel and wrathful witch, she is angry at the loss of her sister and seeks revenge on the killer. 
She is a huge reason we envision witches with green skin, warts on the face, and a loud and startling cackle. The black pointed hat and the long black robes, she is the staple for modern witches. When one thinks of a witch, often they hear the music from the tornado scene, where the first glimpse of the Wicked Witch appears. Hey, Miss Gate. But there is more than one witch in The Wizard of Oz. The second witch introduced is the first real glimpse into the idea that witches can be good. Glinda the Good Witch. She is the opposite of the Wicked Witch in nearly every way. The difference is interesting because not only is the personality and the look different, but they are all different in complementary ways. The Wicked Witch is ugly and mean. Glinda is sweet and beautiful. The Wicked Witch is also associated with being green. And they chose pinks and reds for Glinda, green's complementary color and color theory. They serve to balance each other. This is a theme that witches will fall into for most of the future in entertainment. The 1990s introduced a slew of witches in movies. One of the most famous are Sally and Jillian Owens from the 1998 film Practical Magic. Sally and Jillian are sisters who are cursed to have their lovers die. Each sister handles this curse differently. They have a balance of chaos and order. Sally is cautious and introspective, whereas Jillian is wild and rather careless. These witches become more relatable. If you didn't know them, you'd never know they were witches. They don't have warts or green skin. They don't fall to pieces in water. They behave like normal people. Those are only a few of the hundreds of examples of witches in early media. And trust me, I could go on, but I know you probably have other things to do today. So how do you tell the good witches from the bad witches? We've seen them as characters grow from only eating children and killing people to having the idea that they can be good. Like most moral dilemmas, good and bad are constructs that derive from action and intention. These two ideas go hand in hand when it comes to moral motives. If a person commits an action that goes south, but the intention was good, is the actor good or bad? The same is for the opposite. If the actor commits a deed that is intended to go south, but ends up being helpful or has a positive outcome, are they good? All of these distinctions are important as we look towards the future. Like many things, the meaning of witch has evolved with the times. Harry Potter takes a new turn for witches. It's also one of the first modern films that depicts witches as only female, and only males as wizards, when historically both terms are gender neutral. In this series, we see as magical people live side by side with mortal people, they need to learn how to use their magic and develop their skills. Whereas we never really saw that much before. Magic was always innate, now it's learned. This makes the idea of witches and magic users even more relatable. Learn spells and potions as though you were learning math and science. So where will we see witches go in the near future? We've already seen witches develop over time. Historically, they were misunderstood and feared causing mass hysteria and panic within religious communities. They were developed into roles in fairy tales and children's stories, mostly as evil characters or characters that should be regarded cautiously or with fear. We see themes of historical events begin to develop in the entertainment of witches. The use of a witch's mark by portraying them with warts. Water would melt them. These are fundamentally what the entertainment world has built witches to be. But a slow progression from evil witches to good witches in the film industry has happened as the evolution of understanding the history of mass witch hysteria is fleshed out. Witches become less crone-like and more relatable, more normal. They're regular people that just so happen to have some magic. We steadily see them evolve from something that should be feared to something that can help. Most of the modern witches in media are portrayed as aesthetically attractive and morally aware. If the witch is good or bad, they are aware of their own standing. This is a major development because it meshes the morality of humans and witches. Both parties will follow the same moral code of what is good and what is evil. The intent with or without magic determines if one is good or bad rather than being different and having magic in itself is bad. I'm curious to see how witches in media continue to grow into something more relatable to the viewer, where they can see themselves as witches, wizards, and warlocks. What can the entertainment world come up with next? Will they continue to show witches in a positive light, helping humanity, making positive changes in the world? Or will they give us a throwback of evil fairy tale witches that look like us, but should be feared? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Toodles. <laughs>